On today's World Insight, China marks its 20th anniversary of joining the WTO as the China International Import Expo opens in Shanghai. How has trade factored into China's economic success? And the New Development Bank expands to three more countries while maintaining its sustainability goals. How can the NDB help developing nations amid the pandemic? When it comes to green finance, to green development, to green growth. The time has come. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Today I'm in Shanghai at the CIIE, the world's largest import expo. Chinese President Xi Jinping delivered a keynote speech via video at the opening ceremony of this world's largest import expo. He said China is keen on high quality opening up and stands ready to work with all countries to build an open world economy. Over the last two decades, China has fully fulfilled the commitments it made when joining the WTO. Its overall tariff rate has been cut down from 15.3% to 7.4 percent, much lower than the 9.8 percent promised at the time. This year marks the 20th anniversary of China's accession to the WTO. For the past 20 years, China has been deepening reform and pursuing all-round opening up. The CIIE, where I am now, is literally living proof of that goal. And I had the honor of hosting the high-level session on this topic on the sideline of CIIE. Representatives from international organizations, business community, and academic world all shared their views on China, China and the WTO, and the expectations for the WTO and China's role within and beyond the organization. And here are some highlights. Minister Yi, you literally worked for WTO as the Deputy Director General. And uh, yes, and also you work as the Vice Minister of uh, China's Ministry of Commerce. So I guess you know both worlds. Would you like to share with us at the very beginning your thoughts on the issue? Please, Minister Yi. Uh, China's succession to the WTO uh, in December 2001 has proven to be one of the most significant economic events both in our lifetime and in modern world history. China's historic accession created a win-win outcome. In bringing China under its umbrella, the WTO took a huge step toward its goal of universal membership and inclusiveness. Uh, as uh, the current DG said, without WTO, uh, without China, WTO cannot be called as a world trade organization. As a result of China's accession, one of the world's biggest economies now is playing by the same multilateral trade rule book as other trading, major trading nations. This is no small achievement particularly in terms of strengthening global trade governance and the multilateral trading system. China's successful accession has also inspired many other developing countries to join the WTO. Since 2001, both China and the world have seen trade flows rise rapidly with China experiencing a more than six-fold increase in the volume of its imports, a more than seven-fold increase in the volume of its merchandise exports, China also became a leading exporter and importer of services after joining the WTO. Since we are now in the import expo, let me show you some data on China's imports. From 200 $44 billion in 2001. Merchandise imports into China leapt to 2.06 trillion US dollars last year. I think that's the contribution of China 
to, to the world economy and uh, its trading partners in the WTO. But one thing you said very important, that is how to instill confidence to have a lower hunting fruit so that we can move at least in the positive direction multilaterally. We are now going to have Professor Stiglitz to speak to us again about the challenges of reform. The crisis of values and a power that is at the heart of what I think is at, at, at need for reform. Uh, power is reflected too in the way that the Trump administration essentially unilaterally has from the dispute a resolution scheme. Uh, and uh, since the dispute resolution uh, mechanism is at the heart of the WTO, this meant that a single individual or a few individuals in uh, one country could undermine the global tra rules-based trading regime. Let's have a Richard, uh, Mr. Kozo Wright from the UNCTAD. He is going to share with us furthermore on the same issue. Please. Since 2017, China has been the largest importer from other developing countries. In 2020, over 53% of China's merchandise imports originated in the South with a total value of over 1 trillion US dollars. Secondly, China has been a vital pillar in supporting multilateralism. Through various international mechanisms, not just the WTO, but also the United Nations, the G20, the BRICS, China has championed multilateralism and built solidarity among developing countries. Notably, the Belt and Road Initiative and its recently proposed Global Development Initiative have committed China to very concrete support to international and particularly South-South cooperation. And you're watching World Inside. I'm in Shanghai for the world's largest import expo, CIIE. Coming up, big pledges, but so far little action on advanced economies supporting the developing world that fund the crucial shift to green energy and sustainable models. How can international lenders like the New Development Bank play its crucial role? My latest interview with NDB President Marcos Choiho, next. When it comes to green finance, to green development, to green growth, the time has come. This is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Shanghai on the sideline of CIIE. This week, world's attention is not only here at the world's largest import expo, but also at the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. A crucial question, what financial support will developing countries get for the energy transition? Developed countries have promised to hand out the billions of dollars a year to developing countries to reach global carbon neutrality. Yet, little has been done. So how can we make a breakthrough? On that, I ask Marcos Choiho, who is the president of the New Development Bank. Let's take a listen. I interviewed him on the sideline of CIIE, China International Import Expo. Our conversation started from here. Mr. President, what a pleasure to see you. The pleasure is mine, Tianwei. Thank you very much for the opportunity. What about the financing institutions like yours? How are you going to support the emerging economies to deal with the climate change issue? Of course, financing is a key part of it. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, and Tianwei, the New Development Bank is one of the first multilateral institutions to have sustainable development goals as part of its DNA, as part of its constitutions. We are about sustainable development, and we have so far directed already a, a considerable portion of our portfolio to uh, projects that are climate related, about uh, over about a quarter of everything that we have financed so far, so it's quite sizable. $5 billion is, is the, uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, resources that we have uh, allocated to projects that are climate uh, related. But every single uh, uh, resource that we put into financing projects uh, in one way or another is related to sustainable uh, infrastructure and one that helps uh, mitigate 
the environmental impact that is negative to our uh, member countries. So uh, the, the, the gap that exists between resources and, and projects is actually uh, made uh, shorter by the presence of these of institutions like the New Development Bank. The more actors like the New Development Bank we have out there, the better. You know, Mr. President, a lot of people have been asking whether we are doing things now only skin deep or this will go into the real blood of how we think and how projects will be designed, how financing will come into projects, how it will be assessed, and how it will be preceded. So what do you think, which stage are we in? Not necessarily about the New Development Bank, but globally as a whole. Yeah, I think uh, some ideas uh, have a, a time of their own. And for example, when it comes to green finance, to green development, to green growth, the time has come, not only because we have a climate threat, but because of the most important productivity uh, and expansion gains are to be found in those areas. The challenges there are not only about resources, financial resources, or uh, uh, having the right projects, but it's also about equipping the human uh, talent that we need to perform a productive role in the next phase of the global economy. Uh, sometimes, uh, as, we, uh, Tianwei, as you know, when we think about sustainability, we directly focus our attention to environmental issues, and environmental issues, don't get me wrong, are extraordinarily important. But there's something about training, something about skilling, something about preparing the human element for this next phase of global economy that cannot be overlooked. Otherwise, we might run into a situation in which you have uh, a brand new technology that is environmentally friendly and that uh, is, is very helpful to climate, but you don't have the human resources that are necessary to operate it. We have to move forward, but let's do it in a holistic approach, taking into consideration the needs of, of developing countries, particularly in terms of skilling uh, the labor force for the challenges of this economy 4.0. How is the, the New Development Bank thinking about holistically, as you said, Mr. President? Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the most extraordinary features of the New Development Bank is that it is a demand-driven institution. So our, our, we do not finance one single project that is not considered to be a priority by our member countries. So that, that creates a lot of proximity that actually engages us with the direct uh, beneficiaries of, of the project because the distance is, is made uh, uh, smaller. Uh, there are, of course, different challenges. We're talking about different uh, members. Uh, look at uh, China, for example, who has very uh, clear uh, objectives when it comes to when it comes to becoming uh, carbon neutral. When it when it comes to in increasing the overall uh, relative size of, of, of clean energies in in terms of its uh, uh, energy uh, matrix. Look at the case of Brazil, who's had very pioneering experiences in the past with ethanol fueled uh, vehicles that are environmentally uh, friendly. Uh, look at all of the emphasis now on ESG that you can see in, in countries like Russia or even the financing and tech institutions that you have in, in countries like India and, and, and South Africa. So everyone is paying attention. Everyone is doing something that, uh, that uh, makes the needle move when it comes to more sustainability, to uh, spreading ESG considerations across uh, different projects. And this is, this is very important for us because as we are part of a family of multilateral development institutions, we're able to share some of that knowledge and some of those best practices with our, our, with our member countries and vice versa. So that at the end of the day, the kind of policies here at the NDB uh, we put together is a combination of what uh, we receive in terms of, of what's being done as, as a state of the art in, in, in the, at the institutional, at the multilateral level, but also with the, with a national flavor, with a local flavor, giving into uh, giving into the profile of our member countries. Uh, you know, there has been talk about the 100 billion U.S. dollars that is needed in terms of financing developed countries already committed to developing and the least developed economies back in the Paris Agreement. But people are saying that cash is not on the table. But at the same time, when they say those cash are on the table, it's a huge amount of money, and therefore they need a new development bank to deal with those caches. Uh, how, what would you make of these kinds of debates and discussion as someone who's already heading a development bank for the emerging economies? Chen Wei, uh 
cash contributions or financial resources that are made available by advanced countries to the cause of sustainability are welcome. But uh, I think it wouldn't uh, be the most appropriate course of actions from the part of emerging countries to simply rely on those resources to make progress in their, uh, uh, in their strategies for sustainable development. There's an, offer, there's an effort that has to be uh, taken on their own. There's an effort that has to be in concertation, in cooperation with other emerging economies. And it's also true that uh, in the 21st century, you have much more of a diverse uh, financial systems where when you, where you're applying uh, best practices, when you're applying good policies, you actually have access to those uh, resources. You know, uh, when you look at uh, the uh, uh, a, uh, CIIE, the China International Import Expo, the largest world uh, import expo, uh, you have been playing a role there. Uh, uh, what do you make of uh, events like this and, and the role of New Development Bank in these international events? That's a, that's a very important uh, event, uh, uh, Tianwei, among other reasons, because of the fact that uh, in 2009, China became the world's leading exporter. In 2012, China became the world's leading trading nation. So it means that in the aggregate, its sum of imports to its sum of exports exceed nominally that of any other country. And that is truly remarkable, especially if you consider that one of the central elements of China's economic success since 1978 has been its uh, uh, further and further opening up uh, to global markets, uh, to international trade. And when you have an event like the CIIE, then you sort of concentrate uh, opportunities uh, in, in one particular geographical location for a number of days. Uh, I think the numbers are truly uh, formidable. I, I was uh, looking at uh, the prospects for the next 10 years in, in terms of China's imports, for example. So uh, uh, some projections point to uh, an accumulated uh, 25 trillion dollars in imports that's 2.5 trillion a, a year that is a big boost and that is a big contribution to to global economic growth and to give other countries as well the chance to grow via trade right, right. Uh, as as you and i have also discussed on a number of occasions most economic miracles of the tw of the second half of the 20th century and the and the and the first uh, two decades of the 21st century have been powered by uh, trade for an institution like the New Development Bank, uh, whose focus is on uh, sustainable development infrastructure, that also creates a, a new avenue of, of business. For example, we are very much engaged, and I think this is, this is definitely going to be a priority uh, during my presidency, is the issue of trade-enabling infrastructure. Trade-enabling infrastructure is central to increase the trade ply as a percentage of, of, of global GDP, especially if you consider that not only the physical aspects of, of trade related infrastructure must be taken into account, but also all of those digital or tech intensive uh, aspects of trade enabling infrastructure that have to do with E-Trade, with being able to uh, hire services from abroad via digital, uh, uh, say, uh, interfaces. So all of this is, is, is very new, it's very exciting, and the New Development Bank will be there to engage with some of the actors. There, there's an initiative that we're carrying forward with China's Exim Bank that we will unfold in the next couple of months. So we, we truly see as a, as a, as a very uh, important event in the calendar uh, of, of trade fairs that uh, are housed uh, here in, in China, and one that boosts both opportunities and, and, uh, and new areas for cooperation for different uh, economies. Mr. President, uh, the New Development Bank has been very active recent years uh, in terms of incorporating new members. Uh, you just have some new members joining in. Tell me more about how is the latest in terms of these members joining in, working with the earlier uh, founding members of the New Development Bank. How is the process now? So, uh, yes, we have uh, been given this uh, great gift of membership expansion. So uh, we uh, we are also living up to the name of the, of the institution. We have the five original members of the BRICS, and, and it's always important to, to, to preserve a BRICS character in our institution that's set in our articles of agreement. 
a little more than a year ago, our governors gave us the green light to pursue membership expansion. We have uh, two months ago announced the admission of three uh, new members. Bangladesh, one of the most uh, uh, dynamic economies of the world, one of the fastest growing emerging economies. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, a country that's very innovative, that has a lot of success, successful experiences with, with, with infrastructure. Uruguay, uh, a country in, in Latin America that has already given a lot to the multilateral development uh, forum. And this is a process that is going to go on. I, I think in the next couple of months, we'll be engaging uh, new members. So you see, it's, it's about resources. So there are more resources that we're gonna be able to put to the service of infrastructure for, for these uh, nations, but it's also about ideas, experiences. We can learn from what works, from what doesn't work. The same with our experience in here. So it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been quite successful and in a gradual and balanced manner, it's a, a, a process that will continue to unfold. It's already been several years and people are having such a difficulty to continue to fight, um, both against the pandemic and also against the, um, the sloppy economic recoveries worldwide. Uh, Mr. President, at this point, what you and your colleagues are thinking, what would be to you the best remedy to hold on and fight? Well, you see, um, when, when we look at history, at Tianwei, we will see that uh, uh, challenges of a similar nature are recurrent. Uh, of course, COVID has brought us a number of, of threats, uh, social, uh, health-related, uh, the pace of, of, of economic expansion, all of this different, uh, uh, say, fronts coming together in, in, in making the problem more serious and, and demanding more of a collective uh, uh, response. We, we are part of that response. We are, we are doing our share. And it's not only through the emergency assistance program that we've put together uh, in the amount of $10 billion to our member countries, but we also, I mean, many of our, of our investment actually uh, work as if they were crowding in tools to bring in more investment, uh, if, if, if that's uh, related to the pandemic or if it's related to other areas that are closer to uh, sustainable development, for example. In, in Brazil, the New Development Bank has invested in the biggest uh, solar energy plant in, in Latin America, along with other players from the multilateral development world, from the national development uh, perspective, from the private sector. That is also true about other countries. So this, this crowding in of resources that are, that are made available through the direct uh, action of, of multilateral development banks is something that we are very proud about. And uh, going forward, uh, we can only uh, uh, see dynamism because we know that if we are stuck in inertia, then say the length of, of the crisis, the length of the problem is only gonna linger on. So we have to be very dynamic about it. We have to care also about the quality of the resources that we put together in terms of the implementation. So it's, it's not, a, not only about the nominal amount, but it's also about the development impact uh, that, that it generates. So I might, I might say, although uh, these are very trying times we live in, the power of international, of international cooperation that is represented by an institution like the NDB is going to help us uh, rise above. Mm. Mr. President, at this time, your member countries uh, are having different approaches of uh, prevention and control against the COVID-19. What would that mean for your daily work, for your teams around the world? And how are you dealing with these differences and adjust? Well, we're still facing a lot of uh, difficulties in terms of international travel, uh, which has pushed us to uh, using more technology in our day-to-day -day interactions with expanding the kinds of uh, partnerships that we do uh, with, uh, with, with local institutions. Uh, uh, the fact that we are a, a country, a, a, an institution that relies on country systems has made this uh, traje trajectory easier uh, to travel. Uh, it, it's interesting because sometimes, uh, Tianwei, I, I look at the current situation as one of those moments in which you're watching a film and you want to fast forward it into the future. 
But in order to do that, you have to push the pause button. So it's because you push the pause button that you can accelerate it at a, at a, at a, at a, a higher speed. And this is happening. So the number, of, the number of technological devices that we do now in terms of interaction with potential clients, with those that are uh, uh, both conceiving and implementing the projects is much bigger than, than we did in, in, in the past. Uh, the interactions with local institutions has also expanded, which brings about a very positive, positive collateral effect in the sense that we know the institutions better, they are better, uh, we get better uh, known by, by, by then. Uh, but nothing, in, in my opinion, uh, uh, say, uh, overtakes the importance of direct human contact and, and hopefully uh, the situation will improve. I, I think it will in, in the next couple of, of months. Mr. President, as the head of an experiment, literally, uh, new development bank of emerging economies, uh, what do you make of your uh, track record over the past year, years or so? And how do you look at the road ahead when you think back and think forward, Mr. President? Look at the NDB now, uh, 80 different projects in four continents, $30 billion of project approvals, $10 billion uh, that were uh, put together in an emergency assistance program, an, an important uh, legacy that my, my predecessor, KV Kamat, uh, worked uh, upon. We have uh, started, we, we, we get the ball rolling on membership expansion. We have admitted uh, three new members. This is a process that will continue. We're, we're able also to uh, put into motion a portion of organizational structure that uh, uh, creates better tools to deal with the private sector, to uh, embrace ESG concepts and mainstream them across uh, the, the, the institution. So considerable progress has actually uh, uh, happened and I think it, it can only it can only be that way. I mean, the the the, the COVID crisis cannot be uh, seen by us as a, as an invitation to inertia. We, we have to keep on uh, making progress, making our contribution, uh, and and I think we we've been very successful at, at doing that. I love your analogy of pause and fast forward. That's hope. Let's hope that's what's likely to happen, Mr. President. As always, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing with us your thoughts. And that's my latest interview with Marcos Choiho, the president of New Development Bank. That's all the time we have for this special edition of World Inside from Shanghai on the sideline of CIIE. On behalf of my teams here in Shanghai and back in Beijing, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. Bye.